Now remember, this patient is spontaneously breathing. Here's the person without CPAP, starting at a zero baseline. As they inspire, they may uh, create something like a negative three to negative five as they inspire. They're struggling against all the fluid uh, to expand their alveoli. They're struggling against the fluid in the lung. So we're going to pretend this is the person with the pulmonary edema, the congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema, attempting to breathe. As they expire, their alveoli nearly collapse under the weight of the fluid pressure that's there. And then we put the patient on our CPAP mask. And on our CPAP mask, we have a much improved performance. We have five of pressure. Uh, that one of the problems you might run into, and it became a significant problem in certain people, is that there was an imposed work of breathing with a CPAP system. In other words, when I inhaled, I was sucking down five of pressure that was already there and perhaps uh, sucking down to positive two. And then as I exhaled, it was able to maintain the five of pressure. As I exhaled, it would maintain the pressure. Uh, and thereby keeping the alveoli open throughout the entire respiratory cycle, particularly during ex uh, expiration. Uh, without it, my uh, alveoli would nearly collapse. With it, the alveoli would remain open. Now the problem with the CPAP mask is the imposed work of breathing. Many of the patients that came in and required CPAP were already very weak. Uh, they didn't come into the hospital or the emergency room at the first symptom. When did they come in? After their compensation or their ability to compensate had begun to fail. How did they compensate? They increased their work of breathing, they increased their heart rate, they increased their respiratory rate. And so these things are starting to take a toll on them. Uh, they're starting to lose their ability to continue to compensate in this way. And so their uh, muscles are compromised. So we come in and put them on this system which, uh, let me tell you that a CPAP system is a little harder to breathe on than breathing normally. And so you take somebody who's potentially in muscular failure and saddle them with uh, a small amount of additional work. And in many cases, this might be enough to lead to respiratory failure and the patient would uh, need to be intubated and uh, controlled with uh, full mechanical support. Okay, let's say that you want to argue that you don't think that the uh, work of breathing imposed by the CPAP mass system was that significant. Well, at any rate, it didn't help them to breathe, forcing them to spontaneously breathe on their own with this system on their face. Uh, and people who were in uh, relative muscular failure uh, well, just might not be enough for them, and so many people might fail and have to be intubated anyway. Well, the good folks at Respironics came up with a solution, and the solution was rather than, you know, like the line here, the dotted line you see here, which was inspiration, rather than uh, forcing the patient to uh, expand their lungs on their own, was to give them some support. In fact, it was pressure support. Uh, the support was an inspiratory assist, and so it might look something like this. Uh, let's say that you set an inspiratory pressure of uh, 10. Then as the patient expires, the machine is able to detect that the patient is wanting a breath, much like assist control on a ventilator, and it delivers very rapidly, it delivers a, a flow and until it uh, hits the 10 that you set in for your, uh, what they called was an IPAP. IPAP. It stands for inspiratory uh, positive airway pressure. And it would maintain this 10 uh, until the flow started to taper off. What would happen is the person's lungs would fill. As the lungs fill, uh, the flow tapers off. And then when the flow tapered off to a certain degree, uh, the breath would then end. And then the patient would exhale normally. So uh, the, the solution that the BiPAP people came up with was uh, to use the CPAP mask, the pressurized mask as before, but to add an inspiratory pressure assist to it. They came up with some simple rules. Uh, and that is with the BiPAP system, you can use it in CPAP mode only. Uh, and doctors sometimes order that because that's what they're familiar with. I try to encourage them to go ahead and give the patient a little 
pressure support assist so they don't have to struggle against the system. You're just maybe, you might argue that you're just overcoming the imposed workload of the system by adding uh, a small IPAP. But the rule was this, you must use at least five of CPAP. And on the Respironics BiPAP calls it EPAP, E-P-A-P, Expiratory Positive Airway Pressure. You must use at least five of EPAP and then the IPAP must be at least five above, and this is general, you might argue with this numbers, but generally the IPAP must be at least five above the minimum level of EPAP. So that makes the minimum settings for BiPAP 10 over five. 10 of IPAP and five of EPAP, or whatever you want to call it, CPAP or PEEP. It's all basically the same thing. So now you can see why BiPAP is an extension of CPAP. It's CPAP with the added benefit of a pressure support. Now what is the pressure support? The pressure support is the difference between the, the EPAP and the IPAP. In other words, the patient starts at a level of five. They breathe five over that. So in this case, the difference between the IPAP and the EPAP is this patient has a pressure support of five. And uh, in a few minutes, we can look at some case studies of this about uh, look at some blood gases and make some changes and decide how to change these values. While I was filming this, someone uh, asked me, how does this differ uh, from traditional ventilation? It sounds like the same thing that a ventilator does. And it is slightly different in that Volume ventilation may be thought about or thought of as a pre-measured volume, like in this example, entering a bucket to a particular fill line. When the breath is over, the valve is opened. In the case of ventilation, it's a exhalation valve is opened and the volume is allowed to spill out. So volume enters a closed system until the valve is open and then the volume leaves, the precise volume. With BiPAP, you don't have a closed system. You don't have an endotracheal tube and no way to keep the air from leaking out constantly. So if you tried to introduce a pre-measured volume, it would leak out too quickly. So what happens in the case of BiPAP is you have a constant flow of air that maintains a certain level. Uh, the flow will continue until it, it, it uh, fills up to the uh, EPAP level and will maintain it there. When the patient starts to breathe in, uh, the machine senses that the patient wants a breath. It increases the flow dramatically until it reaches the second level of uh, pressure, like on this bucket. The second level would be the IPAP, and it would maintain that level uh, for a short period of time until the flow tapers off, and uh, the flow will crank back down to just enough to maintain the EPAP level again, all while, all while the uh, volume is leaking out of the system. In fact, the BiPAP circuit has a built-in leak, either a bleed hole or a whisper valve, which you should be careful and never cover. And remember to put the bleed hole or a whisper valve next to the nasal or full mask.